physics in 24 problems. So if, you, if you're just jumping into this, I'm trying to pick 24 problems in Halliday, Resnick, and Walker and solve those as a way to teach the whole course, which is incomplete, but kind of fun. It's just a little challenge for me. Maybe you like it too. So that's fine. So I'm here in chapter seven. I didn't pick a problem from chapter one. Uh, so we're gonna pick one problem. I'm gonna describe the problem and then I'm gonna talk about the basics in chapter seven so that we can solve that problem. I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of problems I wanted to solve in chapter seven. I tried to pick one that was representative or challenging in a way that made it interesting uh, and that would enlighten us on what happened in that chapter. And again, you know, this is just one textbook. Uh, they're all pretty much the same, but not all completely the same. I just picked this one. I thought it was one of the more popular ones that people would have access to. So that's just that. So let's just get started. So let me describe the problem and then we'll talk about the physics of chapter seven. So the problem is a crate with a mass of 230 kilograms is hanging from a string and then it's pushed with a horizontal force, non-constant force, and it would have to be non-constant, so that the crate moves up to this position a distance four meters away horizontally and the length of the string is 12 meters. And then ask questions about what's the force, what's the work done by gravity, what's blah, 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 blah. We're going to solve that. So you can see here chapter seven says kinetic energy and work. And I, I do think that's a great place to start. You know, you could say, let's talk about potential energy, but I don't think that's the best thing to do things without potential. And this, this book does that, no potential energy. Okay, so really the first thing is it says, what is the work energy principle? Uh, it says work is the change in energy. Now, for the cases in this chapter, we only have the energy of a particle, so that'd be kinetic energy at non-relativistic speeds, and we define the kinetic energy as one-half mass times velocity squared. Now, right off the bat, notice that that is kind of weird. We were talking about velocity as a vector, so you might want to write this as one-half m magnitude of the velocity squared, and that would be cool, okay? But you cannot square a vector you would have to take the magnitude and then square it. So we write it that way because we don't want to write a bunch of stuff, but just let you know what's going on. So that's the kinetic energy. And if the mass is in, in kilograms, the velocity is in meters per second, then this would be in units of joules. This work energy principle is, is a different way of looking at physics problems. Uh, instead of looking at forces, mass, and acceleration, uh, we're just looking at changes in position and changes in energy. And that's where we get this work. We define work a couple of different ways. Uh, suppose I have an object right here and it moves over there, some displacement delta R, and I push on it with some force F. The work done by that force would be F dot delta R. So just to remember the dot product, we talked about that uh, in chapter t three or something. Uh, if I say F is, I'll write it the way the book does, Fx i hat plus Fy j hat plus Fz k hat. So it has x, y, z components and delta R is gonna be delta x i hat plus delta y j hat plus delta z k hat, right? You can move in all those different directions. When I take the dot product, I take the component, the x components multiplied together, plus the y components multiplied together, plus the z's multiplied together. So I get work would be fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z. And I want to point out two very important things about that expression. Number one, it's a scalar, right? Even though that's a that the whole thing's a vector and that's a vector, that's a scalar, scalar, scalar. Okay. So the work done is a scalar. The change in kinetic energy is a scalar. We're dealing with scalar quantities here. Second, it's possible that some of these terms could be negative. I could have a negative uh, x component of the force. I could have a negative displacement in the x direction. So this whole quantity could be positive. It could be negative. It could even be zero. Okay, so the work can be negative. That's something that a lot of people kind of gloss over. So putting that together, uh, this says the total work done on an object is equal to its change in kinetic energy. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, so let's see some of the other super important things. What if the force is not constant? 
then we write the work like this. Work is the integral from point 0.1 to point 0.2 of f dot dr. Okay, so you may have to integrate. And in this case, dr is the displacement vector, and we can write dr as dx i hat plus dy y hat, j hat. I'm sorry, I'm switching back and forth. dz k hat. So you can take the x components of this, dot it in that, and you're going to get three integrals. So the three integrals would be from x1 to x2, fx, and that could be a function, dx, plus the uh, y1 to y2, fy dy, plus z1, z2, fz dz. Okay, now it can get way more complicated. Now this assumes that the f component the x component of the force only depends on x. If it depends on y, it's really not really for this level of physics. Um, but you could do that in classical mechanics or mathematical methods of physics. So that does come up some. Uh, in, and over here, you could say, oh, well, if it's a non-constant force, we'd have to use that. But we don't. But I want to show you anyway. Um, another one they do, I'm not going to derive it. They do uh, the force due to a spring uh, is, I'm going to write it the best way. The force due to a spring is K times S, where S is the displacement, the amount that is stretched or compressed, and K is the spring constant. And my chalk's running out. Well, I'm going to make it. Okay, and so don't put the negative sign there because uh, we didn't write this as a vector. It's possible to write it as a vector, but let's just not worry about that right now. Um, and since this is a variable force, right, so as, as S increases, if you pull a spring, the work done by that uh, force is going to be, uh, you have to integrate. So we get the work done by a spring is going to be 1 half K S squared negative. If I stretch it that way, right, the force is in the opposite direction of the motion, so I'm going to get a negative work. And if I compress it, I'm going to get a negative work, right? Either way, because the force and displacement are in opposite directions. Good. Okay. What else? Oh, the other, the power. I think that's the only other thing. Yeah, they write FS is negative KD vector. I don't like that. Um, okay, the only other thing in here is the definition of power. And it's the change in work with respect to time. It's the rate of doing work. So if the work or change in energy is in joules and that's in seconds, then this would be a joule per second, which is a watt. We're not going to do anything with power in this problem. OK, we're ready to start the problem. It's a pretty good problem. I think I picked out a good one. Uh, not the best one. No, the best one. I picked the best one. I picked the best problems. OK. Of the ones I have access to, I, I'm limiting myself to this chapter in this book. So here we have this thing right there, and we're pushing it to move up. Let's just start from the beginning, which isn't really questioned until the very end. And why is that a variable force, right? Uh, imagine that I'm pushing this at, at some weird, it's got to speed up, and it's got to stop. So that's, it says in here that this is at rest, and that's at rest. So I have to speed it up. But... Um, I have a, a problem here. Gravitational force pulls down, but the tension changes direction and magnitude. So I don't really know what that tension force is. So that makes it difficult. Um, let's just calculate this first question that says, what's the force uh, at this position too? I'm going to start by drawing a free body diagram. Here's my box. I have the downward gravitational force. I have this horizontal force. I'm just going to call it generic F. And then I have this tension right there, T. Now, I'm going to have to do a little bit of work here, but the main thing here is if this is at rest and stays at rest, then the net forces have to be equal to zero. So that means F net in the x direction is zero, and F net in the y direction is equal to zero. Okay, so, but I need to pick my x and y axis. Let's pick this. So that's x and that's y. So, um, this, let's just pick this angle as theta, and I'll find that in just a second. Um, I can find that from my diagram. But if that's the angle theta, then I can write the net force in the x direction. What are they? Well, this, this applied force 
and then I have a component of the tension. So that would be this part of that, that component of the tension, which is in this case, the opposite side of that triangle. So I'm gonna use sine. So I'm gonna write this as F, it's all in the X direction, minus T sine theta equals zero. Now, do I know T? I don't know T, so I can't even find new theta, I couldn't solve that. So let's write down the forces in the Y direction. Here I have the horizontal component of that triangle, I mean the, the, hor the adjacent side, so it's going to be cosine. I get T cosine theta minus mg equals zero. So this I can solve for T. So T is mg over cosine theta, and now I can plug that in up here and I get F equals T sine theta, and then I put in T, I get mg sine theta over cosine theta, or mg tangent theta. Now, I'm going to go ahead and find that angle theta. So let's just draw a quick triangle right here. I know this is straight down. I know that is length L, and that is length D. So this angle is theta, is going to be the same angle as that theta. So can I find that based on D and L? Yeah, I can, right? Because I can say sine of theta is opposite D over L. And so you really could go back and just get an expression for cosine, but let's just, let's just find this. Uh, theta is going to be the inverse sine of D, which is 4, over L, which is 12. They gave that to us. Let's go ahead and calculate that just to get a number. Okay, I need to take off my glasses. So 4 enter 12 divided by inverse sine there it is, 19.47. So let's just put that up here. Theta is 19.47 degrees. Now I can go up here and put in, I know mass is 200, what was it, 230, 230 or 230? I thought it was something different. I'm gonna look it up because I don't wanna get the actual wrong number in case someone says, I don't really care, I just want the number, which is a bad idea, but I don't want to support. There it is. 230, okay. So uh, 230 G tangent of that angle, so I get F is gonna be equal, let's put it in, tangent, and then I'm gonna multiply by G, and then 230 times and I get 796.9, so I'm gonna put that over here. 796.9 Newtons. Good, okay, moving right along here. Let's go to the next question which says, what's the total work done? The total work done, I'm gonna leave that diagram right there, but I don't need this anymore. The total work done. Well, let's think back to the work energy principle. Work is a change in kinetic energy. So if the block starts from rest and ends at rest, then the change in kinetic energy is gonna be 1 half m zero squared minus 1 half m zero squared. Yeah, I wrote that out just to be kind of snarky. So zero, right? There's no change in kinetic energy. And the kinetic, even worse, the kinetic energy is zero. Okay, so the work done is zero. The total work done is zero. The work done by these three forces is zero zero joules. What's the work done by gravity? Now this one seems like it'd be very difficult and in fact they talk about that in here but I'm going to just say let's let's, let's plot this out right here's my here's my, my path and there's my block and that's of length L and there's the gravitational force mg and then here's the displacement it's technically going to be dr and the problem is that the direction, the angle between these two changes as things move along. But there's a trick with gravity. It turns out that it's what we call a conservative force. And a conservative force means that it doesn't matter what path you take to go from point one to two. I can pick whatever path I want. So I don't have to do along a curve, which is actually not impossible, but rather tricky. So let's not do that. Instead, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go up and over. And along this path, 
I have delta R is that way, and the gravitational force is that way. So if I write, I didn't write this before, but work, you can also write as F delta R cosine theta, where theta is the angle between F and delta R. And here, delta R is that way, gravity is that way, theta is 90. So that's zero during that path. The work does zero during that path. So now I just need to find how, how much work it does right here. Okay, so let's go back over to our diagram. So there's point one, there's point two. I know this is D, I know this is L. So how far is that? Well, what is this distance right here? If this is the angle theta, then this distance is, I'll just write it as L, sine, L cosine theta, right? Because it's adjacent side of that. So this right here would be L minus L cosine theta. It's the leftover part. So that's how high it moved. Uh, I know theta already, so I can calculate the work now. So work done is going to be equal to, now you're moving this way, and gravity is that way, right? So the angle between them is 180 degrees. The cosine of 180 is negative 1. So it's actually going to be negative mgl1 minus cosine theta. So let's put in our values for that uh, with the calculator. So I know theta. So it's going to be 230, enter, 9.8 times. L was 12 times. And then, that seems big. And then 1, enter, and 19, good thing I wrote it down, 19.47 cosine minus times. And I get, uh, oh, I'll put it over here, negative 1546.7 joules. Okay, that's going to be important. Trust me, I know what I'm doing here. Okay, next one. What's the work done by the tension? This one seems impossible, but it's super easy. So again, looking at this diagram, there's my dr vector, and here is my tension vector. Notice that at any point along this path, the tension and the displacement vector are perpendicular. They're always perpendicular. So no, even though this force changes, even, even though that changes, the angle between them is always 90 degrees, and the cosine of 90 is zero. So it doesn't matter what happens to these two, you get zero. Finally, What's the work done by the force? Well, the total work is zero, and that's going to be equal to the work done by gravity, plus the work done by the tension, plus the work done by the force. Well, that's zero. I know that, right? Negative 1546.7. So this is going to be the opposite of that. So it's 1546.7 joules positive. And that's it. OK, so now the next question. At the end, I didn't, I didn't put this on there because I didn't have enough time, space. So the question says, why can't you just do work done by the force is F times D? I calculated F, and I have D as 4. Why can't you do that? And, and the answer is um, really two-part, right? Number one, this is a non-constant force. This is the force at the end. The force at the bottom would, would be super, super tiny, right? You don't need a large force to get that thing moving because there's no forces pushing back this way. A tiny little force will get that moving. Now, as you start moving up, that force increases and you have to increase. You have to increase the force up to that point as you push it, so it's a non-constant force. Number two, it's not moving over D, it's moving up and over. So you have to include that too. So you have to, it's not a trivial question. We can go around the other way by saying the change in kinetic energy is zero, and therefore I can calculate the total work, and then calculate the work done by the tension of the gravity, and that use that as a roundabout way to find that force, and that's what we did. Okay, so there you go. That's chapter seven problem. Uh, link to the full playlist down below if you want to see those other ones, and that's that. Double, double thumbs up. That was a pretty good problem. I had fun. Look at that, fireworks, and a piece. Does it do peace? Okay, good enough. The end, see ya.